Hey there, everyone. Daniel Lowry from anti Siphon Training back with another episode in our networking fundamental series. Ooh, doggy, it's going to be a good one today because we're talking remote access. That's what we like. I don't know about you. I really enjoy being able to log into remote machines, do the things I need to do, and then get the heck out of there and never having to leave the comfort of my own office studio, wherever the case is. And that can mean that it's across the world or just across town. Heck, it could be just in another room. But remote access is what allows us to be able to do those remote functions, and they are a part of those networking services that we really, really enjoy for those specific reasons. I've created a little infographic to help guide us through our little uh, tour de force today of certain networking services. And it is called Remote Access Connecting from Anywhere, Understanding the Evolution and Methods of Remote Network Access. It's going to be a lot of fun. Let's uh, take a look at where we start. Where do we begin? And we start with what is remote access? Well, remote access basically is the ability to access a computer from another network host, another network computer. I could be logging into a router. I could be logging into a switch. I could be logging into a PC, a server. It doesn't matter. If I'm making that remote connection for administrative purposes, that's probably some sort of remote access service that is allowing that to occur. It enables things like remote work, IT support, as well as management of different systems. And that's what we got here. That's basically what's boiling this down to. So that should hopefully answer the question to what is remote access, but let's keep on rolling down, shall we? Older methods for remote access. There was a time we didn't have all the fancy accoutrements that we have today. Oh no, we started with things like our login. It's a great command line tool for Unix-like systems. It's kind of where it got its start. It's got a default port of 513 for those of you keeping score at home. Functionality, log into a remote host. Using that terminal-based systems, probably going to be accessing it through a terminal. I'm not saying probably. You are going to be accessing it through a terminal. That's how that works. <laughs> Key features here, passwordless login via trusted hosts. Don't even need a password for this. It does have some security concerns, though. Uh, the fact that there's no passwords or that if you do transmit a password, it will be in plain text. Plain text. Plain text. That's no bueno right there. But got to remember, when our login came out, that wasn't a big concern. We just needed something that allowed us to log in remotely from a different host so that we could do our administrative functions. Once things changed, though, this became a problem, and it's something we got to be on the lookout for. All right, so it does say that it is highly vulnerable to eavesdropping for the reason of it being in plain text. And, of course, its status is that it is obsolete due to the inherent security risks. Now, we could have some fun today. Let's go over here, and uh, let's, let's log in with our login. I've got a Metasploitable 2 machine up and running, so let's do our login. And I will do dash L for the login name that I'm going to log in with, which is MSF admin, and then give it the host IP, which is 10.10.10.1. What is it? I wrote it down. 128. There we go. And you'll notice no password, no nothing. And all of this information, if I start doing stuff like if I, oh, I don't know, sudo, sudo cat slash Etsy shadow, and I type in my password, right? All of this information that we're seeing right here, if an attacker is able to sniff your network and gain access to those packets, it's all in plain text. They're going to read it like a book that they checked out from their local library. And that is not what we like. All of this stuff, even though the fact that these passwords are hashed and salted and all that other fun stuff for security there, they still now have access. They could try to offline brute force them. They saw whatever password you typed in because those keystrokes went across the network. That was a part of a network packet. That's an issue. All right, let's get out of here. And let's go back to our infographic and let's see what else we've got in store for us. Another little tool that we leaned on pretty heavily for quite some time was this bad boy right here. We like to call it Telnet in the biz. A networking protocol for text-based communications. Again, you're in a terminal. I need to access a remote host. I could use Telnet for that. And this was the de facto standard for quite some time. 
Default port here is TCP port 23. Functionality, command line based access to remote devices. Let's see here. We've got a key feature, virtual terminal connection, which is nice, which means you can throw keystrokes at it like control C and things of that nature, and it doesn't kill your terminal. There is a security concern now. Very much like our login, Telemate, Telnet transmits all data, including usernames and passwords in, wait for it, plain text, plain text. You seeing a pattern here? Again, hearkening back to a time when, when Telnet came out and our login was out, security was not the biggest concern. People that were logging into these systems, heck, people that even knew that Telnet existed was very few and far between. But as attacks started to go on the rise, as attackers got more sophisticated and understood technology more, that became a security concern that those pieces of information were in plain text, making it susceptible for interception. And of course, it has been replaced by secure alternatives, but that doesn't mean we can't take a look at it. We'll tell Nets into our same server, 128, if I'm not mistaken. And you can see, bang. now there could be a username and password associated with that, but this one does not require it. Therefore, actually, I'm sorry, it does. Ha <laughs> ha, log in right there, right? MSF admin, and then it looks for the password, MSF admin where unlike our login, it just kind of plopped me into the middle of the terminal. This one actually did ask me for a username and password, which was a little step in the right direction. But again, all that plain text, that was all in plain text. Anybody with Wireshark on the network could have grabbed those creds and uh, again, read them like a brochure at the local bus station. All right, so the next thing we got to get into is because of these things being insecure, and we started to see that that was a problem, we upgraded. You said, you know what, let's add a little security. I still like this whole remote login thing, but we need to add a level of security on it. How about we just encrypt everything and then we get the same kind of idea going on where I give it a username and password, I can log in, I'm good to go. In, in walks in, huh, what do they say? Uh, SSH has entered the chat. SSH is a great protocol, and this is a more modern method of remote access. So it's the secure shell, default port of 22. Don't get that confused with the Telnet port of 23. They are different, they are not the same, even though they're just one off and they do the same kind of thing. SSH does it a whole lot better. Cryptographic network protocol, right? Functionality, secure channel over unsecured networks, remote command execution, secure file transfer using SFTP and SCP. We can take a look at that here in a moment. Uh, key features, encryption, strong authentication, password or public key or both. You can apply all that. You can get data integrity, advantages, highly secure, flexible, widely used, and for good reason, right? So we're going to kind of switch gears on this. Let's exit out. I got another host that is running SSH, a more modern version of than Metasploitable is. And let's see here. So we're going to SSH and we'll use our username and password to log in. So the username for this one is SafeLine at 10.10.10.131. Let's get that. You'll notice it's asking me for a password. So I give it that, which is, I think that's it. Yeah, there you go. And you'll notice a little bit of a difference in this login. Lots of really cool information. Of course, that can be changed and modified as you like. But look at all this niceness, right? It's got all sorts of great stuff. And I can do just like I would on any other thing. I can touch file1.txt. I can echo this is, or I guess I would have to put some quotes around that F stuff that maybe that's a little bit easier <laughs> into file1, right? Then cat stuff. Like I'm just like I'm at a terminal. Oh, file one, cat, cat file one, right? And it's just like I was sitting at that desktop itself, hands on keyboard. Very cool stuff, I can exit out. But like I told you, so SSH saw that, you know, with usernames and passwords, not everything is always awesome. Users don't always choose the uh, most safe and secure password. So maybe we should use something a little more secure than that. So you have the ability to use 
uh, keys, public key encryption to make this happen. You generate some keys, you get that private key, and then anybody that has that private key and knows the username is able to log in without providing a password. Let me show you how that works. So I believe I have a public key right here, or I'm sorry, a private key. The public key is stored on the server. And that's how it does the authentication. So if I do SSH dash I, and then tell it the key that I want to use, and then give it the username. So it was safeline at 10.10.10.131. And no password, but much more secure, right? Because this is way less likely to be brute forced, like a lot. So there you go. That is SSH. Obviously, oh, you know what I did want to show you? You can use it for secure file transfer as well. So I can use SCP and give it a username, which is safe line at, and of course I can, I'm pretty sure I can use the dash I option of that safe line SSH key and then give it the password or the username safe line at tell the host 131. And then if I do a colon, I can say, hey, at home, at Safeline, like give it the full path. I want to get that file1.txt and save it here. So I just put a period. And look at that. I now have file1, cat file1, and I have all the stuff. And I did that securely. None of that conversation was in plain text. Much more secure protocol. All right, let's keep on moving, though. We got more stuff to, to check out. All right, so now we have graphical remote access. Now we're really talking, right? Like the RDP protocol, the remote desktop protocol. Default port there, TCP 3389. Know it, use it, love it. This is a Microsoft special, Microsoft proprietary protocol. Microsoft developed this and it is built into their uh, desktop operating systems, their server operating systems. If you are running Windows 11 Home, I don't think you have the ability to do this. We'll talk about that in a second. But if you are running 11 Pro and server and that kind of stuff, the more you know advanced versions of the Windows operating systems, you should have this capability. And of course, it connects Windows computers, providing graphical interfaces. It's gonna be so much nicer. We got some key features like clipboard sharing, printer driver redirection, I'm sorry, print or drive redirection, TLS SSL encryption, so it's all encrypted, and primary, primary use is for Windows to Windows. So let's jump over into a Windows machine. And this is the remote desktop connection right here. Oh, I'm on the wrong tab. There you go. And normally it doesn't look like that. What I did was I just kind of, you can go to search and hit remote desktop connection. That's what you're looking for. And then you type in your computer name or your IP address right there where it says computer. So this one's going to be, uh, it's on a different network. So 192168. Actually, I'll just kind of jump over here. I believe this one is 126. But you do have more options. You hit this show options button and you can put in the username. You can save credentials. You can save this whole connection setting as a specific setting. Plop it on the desktop. Just double click and easily jump right in with all the settings that you like. You can modify the display on what you want things to look like, what quality. Let's see here. What local resources I'm going to allow to kind of cross-platform between these two systems. This is a really nice um, app that you have here. And it's baked right into most Windows operating systems. What kind of experience do I want to have? There's a few advanced things, but ultimately for in all our demo purposes, we're just going to hit connect. It's going to ask me for a username and a password. I fire off. Here's the certificate part of things. It's like saying, hey, it's it's asking you it's asking if you want to connect with this. There's a certificate. I don't know it, but I can just say, yeah, I like it. Take it. Take me to the river. And you'll notice I'm logged in. There's this, this Windows 11 system. I can work at it just like I would anything else. Do all the fun stuff I want to do. It's amazing. We love it. It's, it's chef's kiss to see the lovely dessert recipe of pineapple day. <laughs> Made me think of, yeah, I could go for a slice of that. It looks pretty good, actually. There you go. Once I'm done... Just log out, just like you normally do. Click my name, hi, and then click the three dots, sign out, and wait for it, and we're done, right? Very cool stuff. 
But that's not the only graphical protocol or service or app that you can mess around with. There are others that are out there like VNC, default port TCP 5900, and then it can go 5901, 59, so-and-so, and upwards, kind of in that realm. And it says that the type here is a graphical desktop sharing system. Now, you'll notice I talked about how in Windows 11 Home, you don't get remote desktop protocol. You can't, you can't connect that way. But if you use something like RealVNC, you absolutely can. Because this is platform independent, does security via SSH tunneling or built-in encryption. So this is cross-platform, remote desktop. Doesn't matter what you're on, Mac OS, Linux, Windows, regardless of the version, and you have some great access there. And of course, functionality. It remotely controls a computer by sharing its screen and re replaying input. When I worked on a help desk back in my early career, I utilized this a lot because it allowed me to easily connect with my user, see what their problem was, go, yeah, show me what's going on, and then go, okay, now let me drive. I take over the mouse, I take over the keyboard, I make the adjustments, I fix their issue, and then I disconnect and I walk away. It was great. Because let me tell you what, having to try to explain, God forbid this did not work, having to try to explain what they should be doing, have them try to explain what they're seeing, that is nightmare fuel for anybody on a help desk. So these are the types of tools that we end up using quite often. They're not the only game in town though. We've got VNC, we've got other graphical tools like TeamViewer, AnyDesk, go to my PC. And of course I went up here and went to all their websites. So just to see that you can get this stuff, download it, play with these things. They usually have trial versions and stuff. This one is TeamViewer. And they're all trying to basically fill the same void. You just gotta figure out which one works best for you and enjoy, right? Of course, most of them cost a little bit of money, but if you're working on a help desk or you're working as workstation support, these things are invaluable. And even if you were working to kind of like help your family out, this could be a very useful piece of kit for you to be able to log in and, and help them without, again, going through the horrendous fun of saying, okay, describe to me what you see, right? So there you go. Well, there you go. Remote access stuff, really fun, really cool, and extremely useful, especially for those administrators out there. Uh, you can log into just about any kind of network hosts, routers, switches, uh, servers, desktops, you name it. it. Just about everything's on the table. That said, thanks for watching. But you know what to do. If you got some value out of this, hit that like and don't forget to subscribe. Join us so that you can see all the new episodes and videos that we're putting out on our YouTube channel. Got to hit that notification bell to make sure you get a reminder of it when they do drop. So there's that. And of course, come hang out with us at Anti-Siphon. We got tons of stuff going on throughout the week. We've got an AMA where you can come and ask me and other pros anything you like. Any cybersecurity related Thing, or if maybe you've got some just IT general stuff that you would get some answers for. We'd love to have you in our Discord. So go join our Discord. Go join us and follow us on LinkedIn. We've got a lot of social stuff, so you just got to come and be a part of the party. It's going to be a lot of fun. Trust me. Great stuff going on each week. Webinars, crazy, crazy good stuff. That said, go avail yourself of those resources. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode in our series. Until then, have a great day.